I would like to talk specifically about uh, FTSE for good, uh, particularly in light of the 10 year anniversary we've just uh, reached and also on the back of uh, the introduction for the first time of a FTSE for good uh, based uh, rating system. So previously we've had a, a index series FTSE for good uh, and now uh, there, is, there is a rating system. I think I'll, I'll sort of bookend that conversation with a, an introduction setting the scene um, covering some of the same space that Peter did but maybe from a different angle in terms of uh, the drivers behind the growth in uh, responsible investment and and how that's taking shape in the market what we're seeing our clients using this information for uh, and then how that really uh, feeds into uh, the types of things that we are asking companies for maybe to start with uh, a brief introduction because I think it was it was certainly touched upon in looking at the range of different organizations that do ratings that do indices um, you know not only is there differences in the methodologies but there's there's differences in the business models and the organizations themselves uh, so FTSE it itself is a private company owned by the Financial Times owned by the London Stock Exchange uh, we calculate about hundred and twenty thousand indices every single day so FTSE for good uh, the series which is uh, 12 indices um, and the rest of our responsible investment indices make up just under a hundred of 120,000 indices that we do so you can see it's a relatively small piece of the overall pie however in terms of brand recognition um, and the impact it has in the media FTSE for good um, actually generates somewhere between uh, a, a third and a half of all the media coverage that that FTSE gets <coughs> Uh, this is how some of the areas I'd like to cover today, um, sort of finishing up with the ratings, looking at uh, how, how UK practice can be measured and is being measured and, and some of the current state of things, and then we'll uh, take a look at how companies themselves have been responding uh, to some of the index initiatives that, that we've been promoting. Um, but really to, to sort of start with, uh, and this builds on uh, some of what Peter was saying in terms of the growth uh, in importance and the growth of market share uh, that we're seeing in responsible investment, uh, particularly uh, 10 years on, it's pretty easy to look back over the last decade and say actually there's a, there, there's a significant amount of uh, change in attitude that's translating into practice and techniques on the, um, uh, on the part of investors as they approach uh, environmental, social, and governance issues. Uh, that, that acronym ESG is quickly becoming much more prominent, uh, really replacing, uh, I think in my mind, uh, more of the uh, SRI or ethical kind of uh, investment idea, which really sort of pivots on the notion that um, these are issues that are uh, paramount in the first case uh, in shaping your investment philosophy. Um, they should be dictating uh, how you shape your portfolio uh, Currently, I'd say the, the shift is more towards an integrated approach where you may consider uh, ESG issues. The point is to have an understanding of the risk and opportunities that they present uh, and just make them part of the conversation. Uh, whether you want to consider them non-financial or extra financial um, issues, I would certainly consider them uh, financial. No need for any prefixes. Um, they are material. They can have an impact. They can destroy or create value for investors. You should be considering these things. But that does mean that it's a bit more of a nuanced, sophisticated approach, uh, and which is actually part of the reason why uh, you're seeing more ratings uh, and a little bit less of, of indices, uh, because you know those indices are tools that you know facilitate the flow of capital that are following whatever guidelines are built into the indices. Um, with the ratings, that's a tool that investors can use to sort of choose as and when they see fit in a degree or manner that they feel is appropriate. Um, so really that's, that's the main uh, shift over the last 10 years. The size of the market, I think Peter covered this very well, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on that too much, but it certainly is getting bigger. Although I would, um, you know, say there is a reason to, to continue to be um, cautiously optimistic, but let's, let's focus on the caution here for a minute and say that, okay, it's grown considerably. We're talking about 10 trillion now globally. Um, according to some of the Eurosif data that, that we've put together. Uh, but how much of that is really invested uh, by state or country pension funds that simply do not invest in tobacco and or weapons? Uh, that's a pretty basic approach 
Um, that's not necessarily full integration of an ESG issues. Uh, that's, that's simple sector exclusions. So there's a lot of work to be done. This is still a relatively small part of the overall equity market. It's growing much more rapidly than the rest of the uh, 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 equity assets under management in the world. Uh, but you know, let's, let, let's not pop the champagne just yet. We're not there. Um, we're getting there. Uh, and, and, and we're, you know, continuing to make progress, but it's certainly worth keeping an eye on and, and sort of tempering our, our, our excitement. Um, how ESG data is used? I, I think really for the purposes of this audience, um, I'll, I'll, I'll focus mostly on engagement and stewardship and research and analysis. Um, active engagement as well, which sort of overlaps with engagement and stewardship. It, when you're filling in surveys for indices or ratings, or when you're just deciding how to uh, structure your sustainability reports, your uh, disclosures through annual reports, sustainability report, however you do it, um, you know, that information can very easily be used not only by index and ratings organizations like ourselves, uh, but also you know, the actual uh, owners of your company to come and knock on your door, write a letter to your chairman or CEO and say, you know, we're looking at this, we think it can be improved in X, Y, and Z, and we want to have a conversation about it. That's certainly uh, a growing focus of uh, the responsible investment world. Uh, divestment is, is less and less um, common except with a few particular uh, sectors in mind, and it's more really about engagement and stewardship, particularly as the UK has introduced the Stewardship Code, which I'm sure many of you have, have heard of, which really compels fund managers um, and, and as asset owners as well to uh, talk about, on a comply or explain basis, how they are effectively uh, managing uh, the, their own stewardship of the companies that they own and that they're investing in. Um, whether that's through engagement uh, or looking at ESG issues more generally. Um, I think that'll be a significant piece of legislation. It, it, it's it's uh, being replicated in terms of a model in the EU being considered for much wider approaches. Uh, so we'll, it, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Research and analysis is pretty simple. It just sort of uh, can help uh, a stock picker um, you know, decide uh, whether or not to buy or sell or to sort of weight or underweight a given stock in a portfolio based on some of these issues. But again, it's all about understanding materiality um, of ESG uh, issues in particular for your company. So to talk a little bit about FTSE for good, the index in particular, um, which I know many of you will be very familiar with. Um, and on the receiving end of many of those IRIS uh, surveys that, that are really the data collection agent for the FTSE for Good Index. Um, we have worked in partnership with IRIS on this uh, since the launch of the index in 2001. Um, so FTSE doesn't do the research. We are, uh, I'm, I'm part of an in-house team at FTSE that helps uh, develop and manage the index products, manage um, the engagement work that we do with the companies in the indices. Uh, however, that supported and underlied uh, by the research that IRIS does. So they're the ones doing the active uh, you know, reading of uh, websites reports, sustainability reports. Um, however, FTSE may often be the interface where it concerns FTSE for Good Index membership in particular. Uh, the index is used just like just like any other. So um, you know you can walk into um, a high street bank and find a FTSE 100 um, investment fund to put your money into, and there are also some where you can find a FTSE for Good uh, UK uh, investment fund to put your money into. Um, likewise, it could be used as a pre-screened, uh, a sort of approved uh, universe of stocks for fund managers to to pick for uh, an ESG or SRI fund. But it's been used by more than just our investor clients. Companies are one of the most important stakeholders here. Uh, the way that inclusion in FTSE for Good is promoted and supported by the constituents in the index is uh, something that's been uh, a key driver in terms of the brand profile of FTSE for Good and the media um, uh, recognition of the index. Um, I think very, uh, very, uh, well, a strong reason of why that is, is that the index is reviewed twice a year, March and September. Uh, that's when companies come in and out of the index. That's often a time, of course, when the media and companies in particular are, are very interested to see what's going on. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the construction process of FTSE for Good, but not in too much detail. Um, but before I get into that, uh, j just to highlight a few key features. Um, 
FTSE for Good has always been meant to evolve and challenge company practice. Uh, it's meant to get tougher and tougher over time. So if you were a company and you wanted to get into FTSE for Good in 2003, it would be comparatively easier than it is in 2011. There's more things to do. There's more things that we're looking at. Um, this is the evolution of the criteria mainly. You can see the areas that we've uh, branched out to cover. Some very sector specific like uranium mining, some much more general like supply chain labor standards or countering bribery. But the point is over time we've made it uh, uh, tougher and tougher if you think of it as a, a hurdle for a company to get over in order to get into the index. Our hurdles become higher and higher over the years. But that hurdle isn't the same for every company. It's all risk relative. Um, so if you are uh, a extractives company with operations globally including uh, in uh, countries with poor legal protections for labor rights or uh, environmental standards you're going to have a much higher hurdle to jump over than if you're a uh, you know Western European based uh, media company for example. Um, so that I think uh, is in contrast to one of the examples Peter took us through where all of the uh, areas were equally weighted. So they were saying effectively the E, S, and G spectrum can be sliced up into a number of different parts and we equal weight all of those. We do not do that. Uh, we look at a risk profile at a very specific company level, not even at a sector level. There's uh, sector components, geographical components, uh, government contract components, what you source, where you source, those kinds of things all factor in to how much of the criteria a company must meet to get in. Uh, sorry, before I jump into the Foots for Good ratings, what I wanted to talk about uh, at the end. The index, in addition to being risk relative in terms of the way the criteria are developed, uh, it, it is, I think, sets itself out in terms of uh, the rules-based nature and the transparent nature of, of what it does. So we can go through and look at methodologies uh, for all the different uh, indices and ratings that are out there. I think uh, something that would distinguish uh, the FTSE for Good Index and indeed now the FTSE for Good ratings uh, is the level to which uh, you can see down to the specific ind indicators we would be looking at and how they build up into either index exclusion or a given uh, rating score. Uh, that's something that we're uh, you know, constantly trying to improve upon how we can make it more clear. We've certainly got all of the information out there in the public domain, but if you're a company wanting to understand uh, how to get into the index or how your rating uh, is what it is, uh, all that information is there. I'm not saying it wouldn't take a bit of dedication and a strong cup of coffee and a free afternoon to figure it out. It certainly would, um, but it's there. Um, and that can't be said for some of the other methodologies, I think. Um, you know, there's, there's a key uh, component to this that uh, is not only are the rules quite clear for how we bring companies into the index, but uh, we have an independent oversight committee uh, of uh, responsible investment and corporate responsibility experts from around the world to meet twice a year to make sure that FTSE and IRIS in their review of the indices are at following the rules um, and they oversee the, the, the creation of new standards. So if we're developing, for example, uh, new nuclear power criteria, that process is overseen by an independent governance committee. We try and develop criteria uh, with public consultation, uh, focus groups, uh, that, that kind of thing, so that we're really not reinventing the wheel, but building upon what's already out there, existing, uh, internationally accepted, um, and, and publicly available. So that's a very quick gallop through the FTSE for Good Index. I know there's, there's much more to it, and I'm sure that, that you may have some more questions which we can cover, but I think it's certainly worth mentioning um, uh, a, a new initiative and our uh, first foray into the world of ratings. Um, so the index, which is just a list of companies who meet a certain set of criteria, um, never had a ranking or rating component to it. You were just in or out. It was quite binary. Um, so the index, for example, we look at uh, a universe of 2,300 companies globally. Uh, that's large and mid-cap stocks and developed markets. About 850 of those make it into the FTSE for good index, so they pass the criteria. Amongst those 850, there's no distinction. There's no, they're in by a lot, or they just made it by the skin of their teeth. Um, but there was a need for that kind of granularity from our clients. Um, <coughs> in line with what I talked about at the beginning. They're, they're trying to integrate some of these issues more uh, in a more nuanced way than, than previously. And therefore, there's a need for things like uh, specific ratings. So what we've done is taken the FTSE for Good index methodology, the same rules, the same things that we're looking at, the same way to measure company performance. 
uh, except rather than the output being an in or out uh, indication for the index, it's, it's a numerical rating of uh, 0 to 5 in an absolute sense of overall ESG performance. It also breaks down into various subcategories, so it's a very uh, easy to slice and dice way, uh, easy to slice and dice in terms of the way you can view a company's ESG practice. Uh, you can get a summary score, you can just look at the E component, you can look even down at a more granular level in terms of specific issues like environmental management, climate change, the six you see around the outer edge of the circle. Um, there's a risk and a performance score element to this. Uh, so it's something that can indicate a level of risk of a specific issue, such as countering bribery, uh, and how a company is performing in that, uh, in managing that particular issue. Uh, there are some handouts I've left at the back registration table which cover uh, the methodology quite extensively. Uh, as well as a more detailed um, sort of 10-year report, a bit of a look, look back at FTSE for Good over the last 10 years and looking forward to the future with the FTSE for Good ratings and some uh, analysis that has been done uh, by one of our research teams looking at how to use the ratings to measure the impact uh, that strong uh, performance in a given area has had in terms of uh, you know financial returns uh, or market risk. Uh, there's also a uh, comparison of different uh, sector and country level performance in terms of rating. So I would encourage you to pick up some of those documents as you leave. Um, there's much more on the website and, and, and links are available in the documents as well. So again, I'm afraid there's not enough time to, to cover the ratings in more depth, but we can certainly go into it in the questions, or if you have any uh, follow-up specific questions, we can, we can certainly cover that offline. Um, I'd like to finish with just, because everyone likes to see a bit of uh, the ratings in action. Here's the, the UK companies that have come out uh, top, um, and then we'll also look at UK, uh, sort of the aggregate uh, company practice. So we've also uh, produced online a list of uh, the regional leaders um, this is across all sectors, um, so we're, we're really saying uh, there's, this is where the ratings um, come out. There's an absolute measure, zero to five, in terms of company performance. Uh, there's a lot that goes into getting that number, um, but here's, here's the result. Um, what we also offer in terms of the ratings is if you want a uh, super sector relative measure that can also be applied as well. So you can actually, you know, if you're looking at an insurance versus a utility company and they're both scoring quite close to each other, uh, not really sure what that tells you, but actually if you just want to look at the utilities themselves, you can get a better sense uh, if you had the entire universe to see how they're scoring here. Um, so there's just a bit of uh, food for thought there, but perhaps more interesting is how the UK in particular breaks down uh, compared to the global average in terms of performance in the various E, S, and G issues. So we have the six different themes that we look at. Um, uh, the, the further each of these lines goes out, the better the performance. You can see the global average here is the orange in the middle. Um, and what we've broken down with the other U with the other colored lines is the UK small caps, so those are the smallest companies uh, in the UK market, listed companies. Uh, the red line is the large and mid cap, and then the green is the UK all share, so that's both the small, mid, and large. Now we've traditionally seen that the large and mid cap tend to perform better than the small cap um, companies in the UK. Now that kind of stands to reason a little bit. I think that there's probably much more to it than just the fact that they have a bit more resource to throw at it, but um, certainly that has to be uh, part of the explanation. Um, interestingly though, the UK is the only market where we look down at the small cap level. So we don't really have a good comparison across say the rest of Europe, Asia, or in the US where we really just look at the large and mid cap size companies. So this is, this is the only um, country where we look at the smaller size. Um, but you can see, you know, basically uh, everywhere the UK large and mid cap are better than the global average. I think that, that's, that's pretty, um, that's not particularly controversial. It tends to be that the UK and European companies are, are outperforming at a sort of aggregate level compared to their US and uh, Asian peers. Um, on some issues there's, there's some discrepancies there. Um, generally speaking, um, 
out in Asia, Japan particularly, stronger in environmental issues, less strong on social. Um, in the U.S., stronger on corporate governance, much less strong on environment uh, and, and uh, labor standards, for example. Now, one last thing, and this is a relatively complicated slide, I, I, so try not to read through it all. What I, what, what I would just say is that there's a, there's a tenure report at the back which, which covers some academic work that looked at uh, how inclusion in the FTSE Food Index has impacted company practice. Um, and what some researchers at the University of Edinburgh Business School did was look at companies in the FTSE for Good Index and then a control group of companies who weren't in the FTSE for Good Index and looked over time which group met more of the things that FTSE for Good assesses. Um, and essentially the FTSE for Good group uh, did much, much more over the time period in question in the issues of environmental management and climate change. Um, uh, no doubt some uh, explanation there is the, the work that uh, we do at FTSE in terms of reaching out to those companies in the index to say, hey, there are new inclusion requirements. Um, you know, if, if you don't uh, keep pace with the new criteria, you'll find, your play, you'll, 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 you'll find yourself removed from the index. Uh, clearly that's a driver. Whether that's the full explanation, I'm, I'm, I'm un less sure, um, but that, that truly must have something to do with it. But I think you know, it does make a pretty strong case that indices like FTSE for Good uh, have a role to play in improving uh, company performance and practice. Uh, we've seen that. Um, and that hopefully that trend will continue uh, uh, over time. And quick summary. Um, certainly the use of ESG data is increasing by investors. Uh, the growth in assets uh, under management that incorporate ESG issues to some degree is continuing to grow. Uh, it's growing not only in size but in depth and breadth. The sophistication uh, with which investors are using this data is growing. Um, London and Europe are really leading that change, uh, particularly the larger pension funds. We're going to see for the first time in the UK um, uh, the uh, uh, National um, Employment Savings Trust Nest set up here in the UK. They've already set out their stall as wanting to challenge the Norwegians and the rest of Scandinavia as leaders in the ESG world as far as government pension funds go. So that's only going to push practice forward and increase pressure here. Um, but you know there is a uh, uh, undercurrent of um, push from the investment community supported by uh, the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment, which many of you may have come across. So, um, apologies for not mentioning that before. It, it definitely is worth uh, bearing out here that that is one key driver as well as far as investors are concerned. Um, many of them are signing up to this voluntary UN initiative which compels them to integrate ESG issues and then report on how well they're doing it. Um, that in turn is uh, putting pressure on organizations like FTSE to create more reliable, more robust, more transparent and objective tools for investors to use to do what they're seeking to do in terms of integrating ESG issues. Um, and then that of course feeds into the pressure put on companies to uh, continue to report more, uh, to disclose more information um, uh, in terms of reliability, robustness of the data, transparency of the data, um, all becoming uh, much, much more important as, as that sort of the levers of influence at all sort of points in the cycle continue to turn. Um, and of course, let's not forget that there is an ability here for, for these things to, to uh, affect change, to, to help um, uh, companies improve their disclosure uh, or, or indeed in some cases man management systems practices, reporting frameworks. Um, I've certainly had many cases of dialogues <laughs> with companies who've you know, said, you know, this, uh, the, the potential removal from an index like FTSE for Good helps uh, promote an internal agenda that in other cases was not getting much of a hearing at certain levels. Um, so hopefully that will, that will continue to be the case, although uh, you know, we certainly need to be mindful not to abuse that role as far as um, carrot and stick kind of balance goes as an index provider. Um, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully there's some good question and discussion now to be had. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you.